All right, let's get started. I uh, will welcome everybody to our Next Generation Move Lecture Series, which is uh, graciously sponsored by uh, the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and the Provost Office, and also a division of teaching, learning, and leadership at GSE. And Sulem Yoon, my colleague who is there, and I, we have been organizing these talks for all of you who are here the first time. We had already one presentation by Dan Hickey from Indiana University in January. Uh, I'm going to talk in a moment about our presentation. We have two more coming up in uh, uh, later March and April by Candice Hill from Stanford and by Eric Klopfer from MIT. More information will come about this. So I have the honor uh, and pleasure to introduce Mark Gastile, a long, long friend. I mean, we know each other, I think, for close to a quarter of a century. And so I thought, you know, I can take the liberty to take, tell you 10 things to know about Mark Gastile. <laughs> Don't worry, it's nothing. So he is uh, the only computer scientist to have a dual PhD in computer science and education from the University of Michigan, which he got in the 1990s. Uh, he, he was the first and last one to degree. And it was, he did it before, way before it was cool to think about the connection between computer science and education. And he actually believes that learning theory and ideas should drive educational technology designs. Uh, and to prove this, his dissertation focused on designing a meal only somebody interested in education can pick the name of uh, Rousseau's famous treatise uh, to design a software system which scaffolds students' learning um, of programming or science simulations. He's also very well known, many of you might not know, for creating uh, a co-wiki, which is essentially a collaborative hypertext uh, system where people can create, edit, and share text, and it's a system which is used in universities all over the world. Uh, and he also believes in conducting educational research, uh, to kind of make the point and to show that in his approach to using media computing, uh, that it not only helps students to learn the basic principles of computing, but is also much more effective uh, in retaining uh, students in computer science. And fact number five is that he has written many, many books on media computing, which are very popular with multiple languages. And he also set up one of the first state alliances uh, in Georgia to broaden participation in computing. And he as colleagues have, I think, over the last two decades, collectively brought in close to $25 million of federal funding to support all of this, which I think is a very impressive feat. And even more impressive is that he's married to the terrific Barbara Erickson, who every year sits down with the data released from ETS uh, on who takes the AP computer science exam and untangles the data by gender, ethnicity, and state, something you would actually think ETS would do on their own, but they don't. <laughs> uh, and she found out no surprise that uh, there are many states where actually not one student is taking the APCS exam. And it's something which has gotten a lot of press in the last few weeks. Uh, what's probably more amazing is this is a fact which has been going on for many, many years, but only now it's kind of getting more attention. And so for all of this, um, Mark and Barbara have actually gotten in 2010 from the ACM, of, uh, which is the Association for Computing Machinery, the world's largest professional organization of computer professionals, uh, the Carl Karlstrom Outstanding Educator Award, which I think very deservedly so. And I think for all of those reasons, I think he's also uniquely qualified to talk about next generation MOOCs because his talk today will focus on the design and implementation of a long distance learning system to prepare the next generation of 10,000 computer science teachers. And if you think this is a foolish thought, you all should remember there's about 42,000 uh, high schools in the United States. So even helping to prepare 10,000 computer science teachers will not provide teachers to all of the schools to broaden participation in computing. And it will also point to another aspect, which we don't talk a lot about in MOOC, but now is sorely missed, 
it's not just about providing access to content to helping people to learn things. It's also about providing community because those 10,000 teachers, if they get out there, they will be very likely the only teachers in their schools and they will need professional community in order to kind of keep them going uh, and keep it going. And with that, without much further ado, and I didn't really reveal any <laughs> <laughs> uh, I introduce Mark Gastel from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Thank you, Yasmin. That's very nice. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad she didn't get to the bad things that she knows about me. All right. Um, thank you all very much for, for coming today. Um, here's the story that I want to talk to you about. Um, Yasmin, actually, I think that about a quarter of my talk, Yasmin's already covered, so we can cut out parts of it now. Um, Yasmin uh, was, was involved when uh, I worked with uh, Elliot Soloway, um, or, so she, who she was working with when I first started working with him at the University of Michigan, on an idea called learner-centered design. And that's going to be a theme throughout um, my talk today, is how do we design for particular learners? Um, I'm going to be talking sort of as an alternative to MOOCs, where MOOCs, is, uh, the first word is massive. How do we do one thing for whole bunches of people? Um, I'm taking an alternative approach. How do we look at high school teachers who want to learn computer science? What are their particular characteristics and how do we design for them? Uh, as Yasmin, Yasmin said, there's a huge need for more high school computer science teachers. And I'll, I'll try, to character, um, try to describe that need uh, a little bit more detail and then try to characterize that population. What's that population like? And why, would, why do computer science MOOCs as they exist today not really meet those needs? What could we design instead of that? And I'll be talking about a design we've been working on that features these seven pieces. Contextualized computing education, no install programming, sub-goal labeled videos, worked examples with audio, low cognitive load programming practice, scheduled negotiation, and pedagogical content knowledge. So the idea of learner-centered design, when uh, uh, Elliot Soloway and Ken Hay and I were talking about it, um, this was back in, in 1994, the idea was to contrast with the, 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 prevail, the prevalent model of how we design user interfaces, um, user-centered system design. But user-centered system design really becomes expert-centered system design. We're really designing for experts. We're designing, it, it goes to show, the very first thing you do when you're doing user-centered system design is understand the user's tasks. Well, it's an expert who knows their tasks. The novices don't necessarily know what tasks they're going to be engaging in. They're exploring and coming to understand the tasks as they go along. So what does it mean to design for the learners versus the experts? Learners have different tasks. Learners understand different things. Uh, one of the tasks that we did when we, were, when we were thinking about this was take a look at a very popular at the time design tool for software engineers called Rational Rows. And when you first start up Rational Rows, um, we just sat down and counted one day. There's over 100 menu items currently available to you. 100 possible things you could do before you say start, before you create your new project. What do all those mean? What do novices think all of those things mean? It's a huge number of options available. Novices don't think about them the same way that the, that the experts do. One of the criti critical factors of learners is that learners change. I mean, that's the whole idea, right? That they're not the same on day one as they are on day 90. Experts, for the, for the most part, are homogeneous. Somebody who is an expert in a particular field that we're doing user-centered system design for, they may have a degree in that area, they have experience, they've chosen that field, which may not all be the case for, for, for learners. Um, and then finally, and the critical part that, that everybody in education is aware of, is the notion of scaffolding. We have to help the learners get started. We have to provide some support so that they can do things that they couldn't do without the support. For all of these reasons, learner-centered system design or learner-centered design is different than user-centered system design. It's different than designing for experts. So I'm going to return to this theme at the very end, but that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to take high school teachers and think about what do they need in order to be able to learn computer science. So some of these are numbers that, that Yasmin already referenced, but these, the numbers on this slide are the numbers that really drive my research. Yasmin mentioned, was it 43,000? Um, I've seen other estimates, and I've seen so many estimates, it's like surprising that we don't really know how many high schools there are in the United States. But I understand it depends on how you want to count. Do you want to count schools that are K through 12, all in one school? Do you want to um, how when you break down 8 to 12 or 8 to 9 when you break down middle school? Okay, there's lots of ways of counting it. But Roughly 25 to 30,000 high schools in the United States. There are 2,000 AP computer science teachers today in the United States. 
Okay, 2,000, which means that you'd have to find seven high schools before you even reach 50% odds of finding a high school that has computer science in it. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty rare out there. This is the number of AP computer science teachers that the NSF figures we need to keep APCS principles alive. So what does that mean? So there's a new computer science test, a new advanced placement computer science test that's being created right now called CS principles. Um, for that to be successful, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a pure economic argument. You have to have so many test takers for it to be worthwhile to the, for College Board and ETS to offer it. Um, given the normal yield, the number of test takers that we get from a teacher, we need about 10,000 teachers for it to not go belly up within three years. Okay, that's a really high, that's a really tall order. But let me, let me go beyond the, the, the high school teachers. There are about, according to uh, an estimate of Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute, there are about 3 million professional software developers as of 2012 in the United States. There are about 27 million people who program as part of their work in the United States but are not professional software developers. Okay, so these are people who are doing things like building SQL queries where there's going to be conditionals and there's variables involved. They're building macros for Excel spreadsheets. They are really doing programming. What's really interesting is that according to the, the estimates coming out of, the, out of SEI, um, the majority of these people don't know that what they're doing is called programming. All right? But they are, they, and, and there's so much that they don't know about computing. These are the people that really drive my research. What do we provide them? Um, and a lot of the work that, that my students and I have done, we look at how adults suddenly discover late in life, boy, I need to know something about computer science. How do they go about doing that? It's a really painful process. It's really difficult for them. Um, Brian Dorn, um, one of my students, watched a graphic designer once look for information on helping him pro um, program Photoshop, which is programmed in a form of JavaScript. And he hacked around on Google, and he found a page, and he spent a half an hour on the page before Brian stopped and said, by the way, this page is on Java. You're programming in JavaScript. It's not the same thing. None of what you've been studying for half an hour is actually useful to you. Right? And that happens. So what can we be providing these 27 million when they're in school so that they're more successful later on when they decide, when they decide that programming is something that they need? So here's probably the most dismal slide that I'll be putting up. Um, so this is the rates of people taking advanced placement exams in various uh, majors from uh, 1997 to 2011. So calculus, obviously, that's the, the, the big kahuna. Lots of people taking uh, the calculus AP exam. Uh, statistics, one of the newest ones, the orange line, re really rapidly rising. Here's computer science. We're the really dismal yellow line at the bottom. Now, let me try to explain. I, it's, sometimes this works in talks, and sometimes it doesn't, but we're going to try it here. Could I get a show of hands? How many people in this room took AP calculus? OK, now leave your hands up if you were then became a math major. That's why that line is scary, right? Because AP calculus is the way that kids in high school get access to higher levels of mathematics while still in high school, all right? This means that there's no access to higher levels of computer science. Kids aren't getting any chance to see it at all, whether or not they're going to go into computer science. Totally pull the jobs issue off the table. People are not even getting the chance to see what is real computer science. Yes? What's the, what's the reason for the rate of increase in calculus? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so that the emphasis really I mean most most of high school math is driven towards calculus. Yeah. And, and 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 I agree with you, statistics is probably a lot more relevant and useful for most people. And and they're still the, the message is getting out there a lot better than it is about us. Um, this is a graph that was recently produced uh, based on uh, some of Barbara's data. Um, uh, this is some stats on AP Computer Science 2013. There were about 30,000 test takers. 81% male, 83% white or Asian. Brian Danielak um, at University of Wisconsin built this graph. Um, I'm sure you can't see the details of it, but you can see the, big, the, the black dots, I'm sure. The size of the dot indicates the number of test takers. And the shift this way is more female than male, and the shift this way is more male than female. And you get the, chance, the, the sense that actually the majority of APs are predominantly female. 
They're more female than they are male in terms of the number of test takers. The furthest to the right here is studio art and drawing, studio art, 2D design, studio art, 3D design, then French language and culture. And then way down here, here's computer science, physics, 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 calculus, BC. Okay? And you notice the size of the dot? <laughs> That's computer science. Um, here's government, uh, here's US history, here's English language composition. It's just not there. Right? Computer science is just not there. And mostly it's an issue of access. This article just came out this week, and I just thought it's a, it a really telling one. So Tennessee has the highest percentage of female test takers of any state in the United States. Okay? They had 73 women take the test in 2013. And that state statistic is due to this woman right here, Jill Pala, who teaches at an all-girls school and sent 30 women to take the AP computer science exam in 2013. So on the one hand, yay for having excellent teachers. On the other hand, one teacher makes this difference in where a state ranks with things like that. Okay, that's how few people are taking computer science. All right, so let's characterize a little bit the typical U.S. high school teacher. The typical U.S. high school CS teacher has a business degree, little mathematics or science. For those of you who know computer science, that may be surprising. Business, why business? Because in almost all of the states, and this was recently documented in a CS, Computer Science Teachers Association report, in almost all states, computer science is classified as a business subject, career and technical education. Because it's in career and technical education and because of No Child Left Behind, you have to be highly qualified in your area to be able to teach that subject. Computer science teachers are therefore highly qualified in business subjects in career and technical education. All right, so that's what we're starting with. We're studying with people who have not taken a lot of math and science. They're mostly female. They're more often members of underrepresented groups than our IT professionals. IT professionals overall is a very white, male and white and Asian uh, group. Okay? We're going to return to these themes when we start talking about the MOOCs. Um, CS professional development, for the most part, for high school teachers, is going to be in-service, not pre-service. For the computer science folks, non-education folks in the room, um, this is about whether or not you're already teaching and then you do the professional development versus before, typically undergraduate, um, is, is pre-service. Uh, just because of the way that things work, we're never going to get near 10,000 doing pre-service. And there's not enough places in the, in the country in schools of education that are offering any sort of computer science degree program. So it's going to be in-service. High school teachers, I'm sure everybody is aware of, are a really overworked profession. 50 to 6 hours a week, um, you're working on weekends to be able to, and evenings to be able to do your grading because you only have so much time during the day. How are we going to fit in learning computer science for these teachers? That's the big question that I want to be thinking about in this talk. Um, for the most part, there is no teaching or credential in teaching computer science in the 50 states. Um, there's a handful, but not very many. Uh, the Computer Science Teachers Association recently did a report on credentialing as well. One of the things that this implies, and this is the issue that, that Yasmin was mentioning ago, we need a professional community of practice. Um, Li Xing Ni was a student of mine who did a dissertation on how do computer science teachers develop a sense of identity. Most teachers develop their sense of identity based on their credential. I have a history credential, I'm a history teacher. I have a reading credential, I'm a reading teacher. Math, science, whatever. But there is no computer science credential. How does a computer science teacher come to see themselves as, I'm a computer science teacher? It's from the community of practices. She, she followed a dozen teachers for a year and a half and found that the ones who, who, became, who developed an identity, yes, I'm a computer science teacher, are teachers who were part of a community of practice and, importantly, could point to expert teachers. I want to be like Rhea Galanos. Boy, is she a great teacher. I want to be like that one day. That's where they got their sense of identity. So it's really critical that we offer them that opportunity. <coughs> Now, what is it that the teachers feel they need? What is it the teachers feel that they need to be a better computer science teacher? They need mostly professional development and programming. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes um, from Li Jing's thesis, Exploring CS Identity. And I know that's an awful lot of words. Let me just under read you the underlying ones. I struggle with how to be creative with the programming. I have a problem with trying to make the programs have meaning to them. So I would like some training. One of the things that's particularly scary about this, this is, now both of these teachers that I'm quoting from are computer science teachers. They're teaching computer science all day long. Um, computer science is more for really, really smart people. I'm not saying I'm smart, but I'm thinking that if I have to take this computer science degree, that it's going to be really hard. It takes a little higher level of intelligence to compete in the introduction to programming. This is not a teacher who's going to be very successful recruiting more students into her classroom. 
Um, the teachers have a lot of, uh, lack a lot of confidence about what they're doing as well. Um, and in general, the, there, there's a strong correlation we've seen um, in our studies in, in Georgia Computes between the teachers who do have a sense of confidence about the programming and the kind of pedagogy they put in the classroom. If the teachers aren't very confident, it's going to be worksheets. It's going to be drill and practice. It's going to be do what I do. No, you're typing the wrong key. I didn't type that key yet. Um, because that's what they're going to be more, most comfortable with. The teachers who do have more confidence in the programming, those are the teachers who are willing to do more innovative pedagogy. The learning is better when the teachers are more confident. Okay? Which is a different matter than saying the teachers have got to be software engineers for it to work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the teachers have to feel confidence about the programming. That's what we see in, the, in, in our interviews with the teachers. So how are we going to make online CS education work for in-service high school teachers? Um, Clara Benda did an interesting study that appeared in the ACM Toast Transactions on Computing Education the uh, year before last now, um, where she looked at adult professionals taking online computer science classes. It doesn't work very well. For the most part, our pedagogy in computer science is very apprenticeship based. Okay? I'm going to lecture at you for an hour, and then I expect you to spend eight hours in front of Eclipse to figure out what it was that I just talked about. All right? It's a very authentic kind of instruction. It's uh, apprenticeship-like. It's not a bad thing. It's not a great thing for the teachers. Okay? It's not a great thing for an adult professional who's just trying to understand something about computer science, who might not necessarily value that authenticity. Um, what we find is that the adult professionals in these online classes don't have time to spend hours in front of the IDE. They lack background in things like mathematics. Um, and they get stymied by small errors. And that's a theme I'm going to come back to several times. The first quote is one that you would probably expect from any adult professional taking any sort of an online class. I've got family matters. These are adults, right? They've got all the issues that we have. Things happen in their lives. They just can't keep up with the class in the same way. The bottom quotes, though, are more about computer science. That we teach computer science expecting a great deal of mathematic knowledge. Our problems that we tend to give students tend to have an awful lot of mathematics in them. Um, and then the languages we choose are really fragile. Okay? Like the one, the quote here says, um, there were times that it would take me hours to find one comma out of place, to find that one something that was wrong. So I didn't mind sticking with it, but it just got to the point where I just didn't get it. So why not MOOCs for this audience? Um, MOOCs in general have low completion rates. Now, I do understand the argument that says, but the person who got through this far in the MOOC, they still learned something. I totally get that. But when we're talking about high school teachers learning a curriculum, it's not OK to not cover the whole curriculum. It's not OK to only learn part of the curriculum. The completers is an important thing when we're preparing high school teachers to teach a curriculum. If we take a look at who completes a MOOC, who's successful at completing a MOOC, and I've read some of the wonderful reports from here at, at Penn, um, we know that they tend to be young. They tend to be well prepared in the, in the area. Um, the edX circuits course, the first time it was offered, 78% of the completers had already taken a circuits course somewhere before, but they really wanted to take the MIT edX circuits course. Um, they, uh, so our teachers are female. They're often underrepresented minorities. The computer science MOOCs in general tend to be male, white, or Asian, um, and with little prior knowledge in the area. As I mentioned, they have business backgrounds. Um, MOOCs proceed at class pace. Now, on the other hand, so the, the obvious answer is, well, make everything self-paced. Let the teachers pick whatever pace works for them. Will they ever finish? I mean, that's the problem. There is an advantage to having a class pace. It, it, there's a pressure to keep going, to keep going. Uh, Yasmin and I were just talking this morning about the value of a 48-hour hackathon. You spend a lot of time on something in that 48 hours. That's really focused attention time. Um, that there's a value to that, to getting something done. Um, but the, is that going to work for the teachers? All right, so here are the seven things that we're trying to build into our ebook where we are trying to meet the needs of high school teachers learning computer science. I'm going to spend a bit more time on the first one because it's a little bit of a history lesson. Gazda, how would you get doing this high school teacher stuff anyway? Um, I'll explain what that path is and how it influences what we're, what we're designing. And then I'll talk about the rest of them as we go through. OK. In fall of 1999, there's seats up here. There's seats up here and over here. Please, come on in. Um, fall 1999, Georgia Tech decided that every student who walked in the door at Georgia Tech had to take a course in computer science. And it had to involve programming. Okay? And for the first four years, there was only one course that met that requirement. 
Um, for the first few years, we used a pseudocode approach that um, Russ Shackelford developed, and later on, we used Steam and uh, the book How to Design Programs from MIT Press. This is the pass fail data for the last three semesters that we offered only one course. Okay? And this is everybody in the class, females, males, everybody, females, males, everybody, females, males. Um, blue is you graduated from the class with an A, B, or C. Red is you got you withdrew from the class or got a D or an F. So some you get from this right away. Um, the women in some semesters are failing at about twice the rate as the men are. Okay, the DWF rate, uh, withdraw or, or fail from the course. Um, overall, this course isn't that bad. It's about a 78% success rate, which as intro computer science courses go, that's, that's in the right ballpark. That's what you expect. But this is everybody. This is all the engineers, too, and all the computer science majors and all the science majors. When we break it down to only look at liberal arts, architecture, and business majors, the picture gets a lot scarier. Okay, business majors are passing the class here at 48.5%. So they would joke about 3 p By the third time, almost everybody passes. All right? this, is a, this is a really scary set of statistics. So um, at the time that we were trying to deal with this, there were a bunch of studies coming out about women in computing. Um, one of them, Yasmin was involved in, in the Tech Saturday report. Um, the best of these, um, in terms of the, the depth and quality of the research, is probably Jane Margolis and Alan Fisher's Unlocking the Clubhouse Women in Computing at Carnegie Mellon. There's a common theme between all of them. They say that the students see the computing as being tedious, boring, and irrelevant. Okay? Tedious, I might be willing to give you. We talked about the commas or semicolons out of, out of place. Irrelevant seems really strange, right? Until you think about it from the student's perspective. The student comes into your intro computer science course because they think things like um, Wii's are really cool. iPads are really cool. The fact that you can go to a hole in the wall and get money out of it. Wow, this is just really amazing stuff. Technology is just unbelievable. And you come into the intro computer science class and I say, by the way, would you like to compute the next Fibonacci number? How about solving the Tower of Hanoi? Right? So what's the connection between what I see as being important about computer science and what you're showing me in this intro computer science course? Um, so since spring 2003, we now offer three different intro computer science courses. This is a, a, a strategy directly recommended by Margolis and Fisher, where they talk about having alternative paths into computer science. Um, and each of the course introduces computing in a context that's relevant to those majors. For computer science and college of science majors at Georgia Tech, they take an intro course in Python where they program a robot. Okay? Computer scientists recognize that robots are part of computer science. That's relevant. Um, all of the engineers take a course in um, programming in MATLAB where the problems they use in the course actually came from faculty around campus who use MATLAB in their work. Okay, so these are really authentic. I get the liberal arts, architecture, and business majors. All right, so I need to argue for them that computing is somehow relevant for them. What we're aiming to do is to make computing relevant by teaching it in the terms that the students find relevant from their perspective. So I teach a course in media computation where students manipulate pixels of a picture in order to create effects like you might do in Photoshop, samples of a sound to do things like you might do in Audacity, frames of a video in order to be able to do digital video special effects. We talk about algorithms. Uh, so for example, the algorithm by which you have one picture fade into another one is exactly the same algorithm by which you have one sound fade out. Well, another sound fades in. Um, we talk about iteration across in every CS, intro CS course. You do something where you iterate across all of the elements of an array or a list or whatever. We element, iterate over all the pixels and compute the grayscale or the negative of an image. Okay? Um, so we talk about algorithms. We're talking about all the same intro computer science stuff, but we're talking about it in terms of digital media. Because for these students, computing is less about calculation than it is about communication. They're going to be living with digital media. Let me tell you how it works. So these were the first three semesters after we started doing media computation. Um, there's a lot less red than there was before. Um, and in general, yes, it is the fact that women are doing better than men in most semesters, though it's not statistically significant. But this is really apples and oranges to only look at the colors, because the first one was everybody on campus. This is just liberal arts, architecture, and business majors. When we look at just those majors, we see that we have had a real increase in terms of, of, of success rates. Now, right about this time, somebody usually says, what about history? Okay, you know, people don't
don't go to Georgia Tech to study history very often. Right, this is about 12 people, so there's a great deal of uh, interpersonal variance here. Now, now, this is data from 2003 to 2005. Um, this last year, I just did a 10-year retrospective paper on media computation, and I went back to say, so what do our data look like in the last six years? The stats are still pretty darn good. Um, this is the uh, uh, DF, or withdrawal rate, in terms of the total. So it's this number over the total. This is within the set. This um, so it's, it's this number over this number. But in general, we're still less than 15% of the students aren't making it through the class, which is way better than 50%. Yes. What's that? Are they out? Do they know? It's a requirement. It is a requirement, yeah. Everybody must pass or they do not get a degree, yeah. Did you teach all the Oh, no. I haven't taught. Actually, actually, I'm very excited. I have not taught the course since 2006, and I'm teaching it this semester and having a blast. Is really a lot of fun to, to, to teach this class. But I don't want to make this a Georgia Tech story. So at the University of California, San Diego, um, they started measuring what was going on with their freshmen in 2001 and noticed that they were retaining very few of them into their sophomore year. So they started in 2008 with uh, a three strategy approach. They used media computation with paired programming, students working together on their assignments, and peer instruction, clickers in the classroom. Um, and what they have found is that, and what's really amazing about this, is that UCSD is on the quarter system. They changed one course, one 10 week course, and they've had a, a dramatic improvement in the number of people who are still majors in the sophomore year, which is really pretty amazing. Okay? So, this idea of context, we think, really does play a role in getting students to buy in, to see the relevance, to get past one of those issues that we saw in the, in the earlier studies. And this is how we actually led, uh, led us into our work with the high school teachers. So um, the state of Georgia decided that they really wanted to have more AP computer science teachers. They approached us um, uh, around 2004 and said, we want to have more computer science teachers, but our teachers are business majors. Who's got a way to teach computer science to business majors? Ooh, we like your new media computation course. Could we have that? And that's when Barbara and I, Barbara Erickson, uh, my, my colleague and wife, um, started building the, the, the media computation for them and started our, um, that led into our effort called Georgia Computes, where for the, from 2006 to 2012, we were trying to improve the state of computing education across the entire state of Georgia at once. We had outreach programs, we were doing lots of training. Barbara taught over 500 high school teachers how to teach computer science at some level. Um, we created summer camp programs and seeded summer camp programs. We would offer seed grants to other universities to start seed grant programs in their, at, at their university for, for uh, students in their region. Um, over 1,000 students took um, uh, summer camps in computer science in Georgia just last summer from, from, from all of these, these summer camps. Um, we also did undergraduate teacher professional development, which was the least successful portion of the whole program. But we don't need to go there. We're going to focus on the high school stuff. Um, these are pictures of some of the cool things that they do. This is actually where the media computation is. Picture in front of the green screen. Now let's replace the green screen with something else and put the teachers on, in the jungle or on the moon. Um, various kinds of how to teach computer science. This is a really great activity that Barbara came up with. Um, if you ask teachers to sort, it's pretty easy to look at the numbers and just sort them. But if you put the numbers as being weights in a cup, now the only way to sort is the same way a computer does. You pick up two of them and figure it out. And so it's much more authentic to do the, uh, the algorithms that way. Um, so what happens when you teach 500 teachers how to teach computer science in a state? You get a lot more people taking AP computer science exams. Okay, this has been our, our uh, we started George Computes in 2006. Um, and the number of females is rising. The number of blacks is not going up as much. And it's an active area of research for us to find out how to make that work. The number of Hispanics has gone up as well. Um, and it's not that everybody's been going up at the same rate. This is actually two pieces of a paper that um, Barbara and I are presenting next week at the, the Specialist Group on Computer Science Education, the SIGC Symposium. Um, we've been, we took California and Maryland as the two, two of the top AP uh, states uh, in the United States, the, the top performers. Um, Georgia and Massachusetts were the two states that, were, that got BPC alliances. And then Indiana and Michigan are amazingly similar. Indiana to Massachusetts, Michigan to Georgia, in terms of population and in terms of uh, diversity. Um, and we see, I mean, California's has been going up the last few years. Maryland's doing well. Massachusetts and, uh, and Georgia have both had rises. 
Um, Indiana and uh, Michigan, not so much. In fact, Michigan, um, as you can see, is 14% black, 4%, almost 5% Hispanic, had exactly seven out of 577 test takers who were black and five who were Hispanic. Okay, so in preparation for this talk, I did look up the Pennsylvania numbers. People know what the Pennsylvania 2013 APCS numbers are? And that's what happened. So you're slightly, um, slightly above Indiana and Michigan, but below Massachusetts, even though you have twice as much population in terms of number of test takers. The demographic information is really horrible. Um, only 12% female. You, the state is 11.4% black. You had only 2% black test takers. Um, the state is 6% Hispanic. You had only 1.9% Hispanic test takers. So there's not a lot of computer science in high schools here in Pennsylvania. So the question is, can we reach more teachers online? All right, we're only going to get so many teachers physically into classrooms. There's no way we're going to get enough to get to 10,000 teachers um, uh, in the next two to three years. Online is our only hope. So we've decided to go after e-books as our medium rather than a lecture starting from a lecture basis the way that, that, that many MOOCs do. Why e-books? because we're trying to deal with this in-service problem. We want to do something that teachers can spend a little bit of time on now, a little bit of time on later. People know how to read a book at a pace. I'll read a couple pages today, I'll read three pages tomorrow. Right? They, they, people know how to do that, that's where we started from. Um, Brad Miller at Luther College has this uh, publishing house he's developed. This is an online website, he's been developing this really wonderful suite of tools called RuneStone Interactive. Um, and we've teamed up with him and are creating additional things that fit into his tools. He wants to one day be the LaTeX of interactive books. Um, and for the five people in the room who know what LaTeX is, you, you get what the idea is. But he's trying to produce the tools that make it possible to build these kind of interactive books. So that was number one, contextualized computing education. Number two, it's on the web, nothing to install. So you actually program inside the book. Okay, it's on a web page. You just go up there and you can edit any of this and it runs again. Um, we get a visualization so you can run the code and see what's going on in terms of the data inside of it. Um, it's completely open. You can program anything you want with Python inside of this. Um, but we typically give you code that you're then modifying. Right? So it's a modification. Now, why does it have to be inside uh, the web browser? So my colleague Ellen Zagura does a lot of work in, um, in Liberia. And when we were, she was talking about she'd like to do more computer science education in Liberia. And so we were talking about what's, what's available there. And it turns out her schools can get to websites that my schools in Atlanta can't. All right? The IT infrastructure in high schools is amazingly locked down. The firewalls are really harsh. Um, Steve Cooper um, has had this effort to get Alice into high schools for several years. And he talks about some of the problems that he's had where he goes into schools and he can't download it from the web because the sites he wants to get to are outside the firewall that's set up around the county. He can't put it in the CD because the CD drives are removed. And then he finds the schools where to prevent you putting a USB stick in, somebody's filled them with glue guns. So it's quite literally the case that my friend Ellen, Gazura, Ellen Zagura can get to more things in the developing world than the high schools in Atlanta can get to in terms of computer science education. So it's got to live in the browser. You can't install anything on these machines in the high schools in the United States. Now, we do want to use videos in this ebook because videos are really good for explaining how to do something. But we've been trying to figure out how can we make videos more effective for explaining how. We want them to be worked examples. We know that that's a very effective way of, 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 giving, of, of using, um, of explaining a process. Richard Katchenbone has been working on this mechanism he calls sub-goal labeling. Okay, so imagine I'm gonna have you do, there's a couple seats up here. Does, imagine that I'm gonna show you how to do an ANOVA. I'm gonna say, okay, first add up the numbers in the first set, now um, figure out how many numbers there are, now we divide one by the other, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna tell you all the steps, maybe there's 25 steps. I can just tell you that. Or I could say, first, you're going to compute the average of the first set of numbers. Add up all the numbers, count the number of numbers, divide one by the other. Now we're going to compute the average of the second set of numbers. Here's the three steps. Here's the mean screen errors. I mean, all the various steps. What Richard found is that when you're dealing with things like statistics, people remember the sub goals and they transfer those. Nobody had ever tried this with computer science before. So we worked with one of his students, Lauren Marshall. So here's the experiment. We've got two groups. 
And we're going to teach people how to use App Inventor, which is a, a visual programming tool that's used for building Android apps. It comes out of, uh, out of MIT. Half of them are getting the original videos. Barbara had already made a bunch of videos on how to teach App Inventors to teach her. Lauren took the other half and put sub -goal labels in them. Um, and the materials were identical except for the sub -goal labels. So, for example, here's the list of steps to do to build one app. Here's the list of steps where I'm going to tell you what the sub goals are. Okay? The videos are only very slightly different. Here's one of the original videos. And what we're going to want is a button that has a picture of a Oh, shoot. No, this is the one with the sub goal. Dang it! And under the properties, we'll change the text. I linked in the wrong video. And put an image for it. All right, let's see if maybe the next one is the original. Maybe the next one is the original. And we're going to want to... Ah, no, both of them have some pop ups All right, anyway, um, that little box that came up is the, is the sub-goal. And the one of them, uh, let's see, yeah, so like that. The call-outs got added in. That's the only difference between the two videos, okay? So here's the experiment. Um, you, get, you, you watch one of these videos and you get the text, and then you try to build the app. And then you go away for a week, and you come back, and you try to do what you did last week. We give you information on building a second app, you try to do that, and then we try to build an app from scratch. Transfer desk. Okay. Results overall. Um, the orangish is with the sub goals, the reddish is uh, conventional videos. There's a statistic statistically significant difference in terms of the number of steps attempted, the number correct. And the ones with the sub goals take less time. So they do the right things, and it takes less time. A week later, they're still better, okay, in terms of number attempted and number correct. But then we start getting the transfer task. And the transfer task, one of the things you had to do was you're going to build something visually, but you have to assign a variable to it so that you could use the variable later. They could, they couldn't. Okay? One of the other observations Lauren made is that the people with the sub goals pulled out a lot of visual blocks that they never used. They were thrashing. They really didn't know what they were doing. Adding these really simple sub goals has had a dramatic impact on being able to replicate the process, retention a week later, and being able to transfer. So Lauren just, there was just a COG side paper that just came out this last summer. The original work was uh, presented at the International Computing Education Research Conference in 2012. Last summer, Lauren presented this study. We just replicated the study with high school teachers. What's really interesting is we only got 18 subjects to stick with it. I mean, they, you know, it's kind of a boring task to, to watch these videos and do the things in App Inventor. But they still got statistically significant differences in the right direction because the effect size was twice as large. And I really don't know why yet. Why would building the sub goals be twice as effective for the high school teachers as it was for the undergrads in the psych pool? But it was, and that's a really big benefit for us. So one of the things we want to do in all the videos that we put into the ebook, we want the sub goal labels because it really has an effect. So in general, we don't use enough worked examples in computer science. There's a lot of evidence for that. But there's also a lot of evidence from cognitive science that people don't read programs as text. You don't read them word for word. You read them as if they were um, diagrams. Okay? That's what the, the folks at Indiana University have been doing some work on this later. Right? You'll, you'll see a variable and look for all the places where that a variable appears. Um, so what we want to do is capitalize on modality effects. We know that it is more effective if I'm going to give you a diagram, than if I'm going to give you an explanation of that diagram as text, it's more effective for me to give you that diagram and read you the text, the, the dual modality effect. So we should explain programs in the same way. And Brianna Morrison is a PhD student working with me who's running this experiment literally right now of uh, comparing text explanation for programs, audio explanation for programs, and text plus audio. So we know that the cost of an erroneous semicolon in Java is about a half an hour. Okay? Now, for an in-service teacher who's got, oh, I've got 45 minutes to work on something tonight in my ebook. A wrong semicolon losing a half an hour is an awful lot of productive time that's lost. So what we need is low cognitive load programming activities. So we've been using something called Parsons problems. Parsons problems, I'll show them to you and then I'll go through the rest of this. 
I'm going to give you a problem to do, and I'm going to give you all of the right lines of code, but they're on refrigerator magnets and scrambled. Put them in the right order. What's really interesting is uh, Beth Simon and Paul Denny did the work that solving this pro these programs correlates very well with being able to write programs. It seems to be measuring the same kinds of things. But you don't get it wrong with semicolon here. All right? So it's a way of, of engaging teachers in thinking through programs in the same way, but lower cognitive load. It's no more, we don't have the extraneous detail of where does the semicolon go. Now, we're really concerned about the professional community of practice that Yasmin's been thinking about. So we're taking a metaphor of e-books. Well, why not extend that metaphor slightly? You've got reading groups, a book club. You and four or five of your friends are going through the book at once, and we built a system we're calling Schedule Negotiate, where you can say, um, here's your group, here's how everybody's doing toward the current goal. We can discuss the goal. You can say things like, um, you know, I, I've had a bunch of deadlines due this week. Might we push the end date by another two days? Sounds reasonable to me, but let's do it. And you negotiate a new schedule. So it's not the same pace as 10,000 people, not your closest friends. Instead, you've got four or five people. We want to pick the reading groups so that they're homogeneous. They're like one another. They would understand the paces in their lives. Uh, I've got the IQ test of basic skills on Thursday. Can we push off for a couple of days? Sure, I understand. Okay? So there is peer pressure. There is social pressure to complete. But it's negotiated, and it's negotiated a bunch of people who have similar understanding of issues. The last thing that we're building into our ebook is a notion of pedagogical content knowledge. We want to tell people what, what, how to teach these things and what are problems you might have. So we'll talk about playing turtle when you're doing dirt, turtle and Seymour Papert's notions of body syntonic. We want to talk about what are the common misconceptions about assignment statements. And if you saw Sammy have a particular answer, which one of these misconceptions might Sam be, be representing? Because we know that this is some of what the teachers want to have that confidence. I need to know how to figure out what my students have wrong and how to help them through it. So how do we design for high school teachers as computer science learners? I've given you the seven things that we're building into our e-books. We need tools that are accessible, not necessarily authentic. Professional software engineers do not program a little box inside of a web browser. They use things like Eclipse and Xcode and Idle. But these teachers aren't concerned about being authentic. They're concerned about being able to get access to things. Um, the low cognitive load activities are really important for deliberate practice. I'm less concerned about them knowing how to debug the semicolon, and I'm more concerned about them understanding the computer science and having confidence about it. Um, I, I want scaffolding that makes the, programming, the, the learning efficient. These people have very little time. I want to play with things like dual modality so that I can get things across so that I can help them learn more efficiently. I don't want them spending eight hours in front of the Eclipse. I want to give them things like Parsons problems so they can learn more efficiently. I want to support groups and community of practice, and I want to provide access to the information that teachers want. They say that they want to learn about programming, and they want to learn about pedagogical content knowledge. And so that's what we're building into the books. My conclusion, MOOCs are really great for some audiences. There are some things that MOOCs have been shown to be really successful for, in particular, continuing education for well-prepared learners. But we should not believe that any single learning interact, uh, intervention is going to meet all needs. Um, in particular, we should design for the learners. And then for teachers, we're trying to design an ebook that addresses their particular needs and constraints. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. It's too warm and everyone's gone to sleep. Yes, me. Sure. Parsons problems, for example, could easily put into a, a, a MOOC platform. I'd actually bet, I mean, this is one of the hypotheses that falls out of the dual modality issue that Brianna Morrison is looking at. Computer science teachers will tell you that the students who come to lecture actually do better in the class than those who don't come to lecture. Maybe it's because they're hearing programs explained to them rather than reading it from the book. Okay? You could easily do that in, well, I don't know about, you probably could do that easily in a MOOC platform. I'm thinking something about looking at code in a video, it's hard to be able to, I mean, it's hard to get the green size, the resolution right, so that you can really see what's going on. But one could imagine doing that. Um, but some of the things that we're doing don't lend themselves to a MOOC platform. In particular, we like the idea of, of, a, of a book because people know how to pace themselves with a book. You probably could do something like our reading slash study groups 
in the MOOCs as well. And try group based pacing in a MOOC. Yes? I have two questions. And I want to make sure you can answer them. So, I agree. Sure does. Yep. Um, and so, what do you think about this? Is my first question. What do you think about assuming sort of entry level science, computer science, in like pre service science classes? Entry level computer science into pre service yeah, science classes. Like, oh, that, I didn't know. I didn't think that was the direction you're going to go. But well, that's I a really to... interesting idea. I yeah. really love it. There are a couple people who are really pushing in this idea of using the new next generation science standards as a way of introducing computer science into the high school classroom. Um, in particular, I'm thinking Irene Lee and the Guts Project in New Mexico. Yeah, and, the, and Uri Walensky's work um, at Northeastern with his, uh, his uh, parallel modeling project in, in NetLogo. Um, uh, Uri has actually sat down and figured out how his stuff maps to NGSS, so he can sit down with the teacher. Another big advantage of that is the science teachers have a math and science background. Um, you know, there's, there's this great book by Nathan Ensminger, he's a historian, um, The Computer Boys Take Over, familiar with it? Okay, where he makes the argument that math, that all of the studies of math as a, predict, as a predictor for computer science uses the outcome variable success in computer science classes, as opposed to a predictor variable of success as a programmer or success in industry. There's actually not a lot of evidence that you need a lot of math just to be a computer scientist, okay? But to get through computer science classes, you do need a lot of math. A lot of our examples dwell on math or programming languages assume a bunch of math. So um, those teachers would have that background. So I see that as being a really interesting way. Um, some of the downsides of it. Uh, computer Science Teachers Association, CSTA, is very much against this. Their concern is, is I, I think it's a reasonable one, if our problem is we don't have enough resources to produce all of the computer science teachers, does it make it better to say, and now we're going to cover all the science teachers as well? I mean, there's even more people to try to spread a very thin amount of, of, of resources over. Um, the other downside, they've got a context. I totally buy the context. It's probably easier for the teachers to learn. I, I agree. Um, yeah. So the other issue that they raise is that does this simply push computer science further off the table? Oh, now it's just part of science. Oh, you, 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 we don't have to worry about you. As opposed to you know, computer science, in most, play, in most of the states that have made computer science count toward high school graduation, they've made it count as a math, not as a science. In Georgia, it counts as a science, but this is really weird. AP computer science counts for science credit towards high school graduation. It can be taught by a business teacher, of course. I mean, computer science is in career and technical education. Um, and then Barbara worked really hard when they first said, and only business teachers. She said, wait, I got great APCS teachers who are former math teachers. They said, okay, math teachers can teach it too. But that's it. Okay, so APCS counts as a science, but it can't actually be taught by a science teacher in Georgia. It must be taught by a business or a math teacher. Very weird. So, your second question. Did, did, that, did that address your first issue? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're trying to do the same thing in the Rosemary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So that's great. Um, the second question is, um, so your person's problems really reminded me of the blocks-based programming, yep. the graphical programming stuff that yep. Scratch and, yep. and Star Logo TMP does. And so is, would that be enough? I guess I'm, I'm, my, where I'm going with this is your notion of computational literacy. Mm -hmm. So is that enough for our science teachers to learn? Uh, you know, A graphical programming language. Graphical is that enough? Language, is that enough for it to be well, I don't know about computer literature because I don't really know what that means. I don't either. Um, but, but, <laughs> but let me offer you, um, so we're, we're, we're trying to team up um, STEM C proposal season, right? So we're all working on STEM proposals. And we're trying to build the next versions of these. When we started on the ebook, um, we picked Python because we knew how to build Python into the book. Turned out to have been a bad bet. None of the CS principles curricula have come out using Python. So we're now looking to move to something else. Um, we are going to try to support Snap, but we're also going to support JavaScript. Why JavaScript? Because the CS principles effort that code.org is doing is doing Blockly and JavaScript. And if my goal is to make the teachers feel confident, I think they'll feel confident about Blockly pretty easily. 
the JavaScript is where the problem is. And so that's what we're trying to support. So it, it might work. It might work to do just the block stuff. But in some sense, that's, that's not the problem I'm tackling. I want to tackle the hard stuff. The hard stuff is learning to do the textual programming in what we perceive as being a, text, a traditional programming language. I think that's not going to go away. Barbara's actually running a trial right now, just started this week, where she's using the Parsons problems with Java for APCS students. I mean, we've got to work with Python. It's pretty easy to make it work with Java as well. Um, so we see that this is a really interesting kind of practice to push on. So for right now, we're going to stick with textual languages, but in this block-like world. Yep. Sir. How you doing? Good. Great talk. Um, Thank you. This question came about the thought process that is there as you're considering um, there will be people of different cultures and uh, male and female. The thought process was kind of design of the people. Uh huh. And are you considering all of that as you design the people that being used to design in this certain way? Because this certain culture will be interacting with it or anything? No, I'm not. But that's not because I don't know how. Um, this is an active area of research for, um, for Betsy DeSalvo, who's one of my colleagues in the School of Interactive Computing. And we actually just got a, a, uh, uh, a small seed grant to start exploring this question about the online master's degree at Georgia Tech, which is all MOOC based. So um, let me tell you a little bit of the Betsy DeSalvo story, because it's, it's relevant here. Um, so Betsy started out in, in work asking a question, why is it, how did most computer science faculty get to be computer scientists? Where, how did they get interested in computer science? And a huge percentage got into it because they got into video games. And they got into tweaking video games and customizing video games. All right, so video games are a pathway into computer science. And then she looks, the demographics that play the most video games are African American and Hispanic teen men. And they are the smallest percentage in computer science. This is a very weird problem. So she engaged in a participatory design activity to try to tease out what the issues were. And her, that participatory design activity came up with this development of this project called Glitch, where she hired African-American teen males in the Atlanta area and taught them to be game testers. As game testers, they got a job. They were paid to be game testers. They took in games from game studios around Atlanta. They were trained under the electronic arts um, testing regimen. They learned how to be, to be game testers. Um, and then they, uh, uh, they had to go beneath the surface. You can't just play the game if you're a game tester, because the game's going to break. And you've got to be able to describe the break to somebody else and explain what, what went on. Um, Glitch was amazingly successful. All of her subjects, uh, her participants, graduated from high school. And 80% of them went on to post-secondary computer science, which is huge numbers. Um, I mean, in terms of, since they're low numbers to begin with, I mean, she had like 24 subjects, something like that. But 80% of the uh, advanced post-secondary computer science is really pretty significant. Um, but what's really interesting was how they dealt with being computer science students in their communities. So like they said, even though they were studying computer science here, they said they never told anybody that they were studying computer science. They said they told their grandma that they had a work-paying job. They said they told their friends, I get paid to play video games. They, got told, they told other kids who were at the high school, but not their close friends, I get to go to Georgia Tech, where all the cute, all the cute girls were. OK, which is sort of, anyway, uh, Georgia Tech. Um, so there was a lot of face shaping that was going on. And that's something that, that Betsy and I are, are now trying to explore. So Georgia Tech has this online master's degree, um, all based in MOOCs, working with, uh, with Udacity. Um, and AT&T fronted $2 million to start this. And what AT&T got in exchange is that all of their participants, all of their employees, get into the, the degree program for free. Okay? And, a, and so the online master's degree we have now discovered, now that we've had our first cohort in and we're starting our second cohort, is even more male and white and Asian than the face-to-face -face master's degree courses at Georgia Tech. Okay? How could that be? All right. So it actually creates this amazingly cool opportunity to use um, Betsy's participatory design techniques because AT&T is physically down the street from us. We can walk there. We know they have female and underrepresented minorities employees. We can go ask them. We can do her participatory design techniques. So, um, so that's a very long answer to your question. I'm sorry. No, we're not doing anything in particular 
to be broad, broadly cultural in our ebook, but mostly because we don't know how, and we're trying to figure that out. Yes, sir? I sort of follow up on that question. So, same time as you're doing this project, uh -huh. Georgia Tech is moving into doing an online MOOC based master's program. Yep. yep. What's the intersection between those two? That is to say, what are the implications for what Georgia Tech is doing in terms of an online MOOC based master's program for what you're coming, what you're discovering in, in this project? All right, so I was afraid of getting a question like this since it's being recorded. Um, it's tough to say, nothing at all. The online master's project isn't drawing on any of the research going out at Georgia Tech in this area. Other questions? I didn't mean to kill everything. Yes? Uh, I wanted to ask if you plan to include in your ebook or the CS uh, uh, prep courses, anything related to other tracks than software development as in testing or project management or agile software as project management or it, methodologies? It's a great question. Um, no, we're not going there, but that's because we're, we're being driven by the CS principles curriculum. All right? Um, AP Computer Science does include some of that stuff, but we're trying to support this particular goal of CS 10K. We need 10,000 AP computer science teachers for the new CS principles by the time it rolls out. Um, and those sorts of things, for the most part, are not in CS principles. CS principles include ideas like abstraction, um, big data, uh, algorithms. Those are the sorts of things that we're focusing on. The, the CS principles include some broader ideas, too, like creativity and collaboration. Um, we're not spending a whole lot of effort on those either because, again, sort of like my question, my response is soon, we want to go after the, the hard stuff. Right? I think we know something about teaching teachers about collaboration and small group activities. I think we know something teachers probably already know more about teaching creativity than any uh, computer science professor at Georgia Tech could teach them. Um, but what we're after is those things that we know that the teachers are lacking confidence in that they need in order to be able to do innovative, innovative pedagogy. That's what we're focusing. Yes. No. No, 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 not at all. No. I mean, um, the outcomes are set, right? So uh, I can show you lists of things which could be on the test. And you as a teacher have to prepare people for that test. Now, AP Computer Science Level A, since it's been out for a few years, yes, there are curricula that you could adopt. And you could simply follow them formulaically. Um, for CS principles, there have been a set of pilots and I don't know that we even know that any of the pilots, the curricula for the pilots, actually hit all of the CS principles. I mean, the test doesn't exist yet. There are pilot versions of some questions that are floating around. So it's, it's hard to say whether any of the curricula actually do prepare students well for those tests. But in general, there are very few curricula. And they're definitely, I, wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't call them formulaic yet. OK, but that was partway through your question. Go ahead. Who's involved in build, developing the test or the, the curriculum? Test, the test and, and obviously the curriculum follows, I guess. Yes. Um, no, it's the other way around because they, they're developing the curriculum first. It's a really long and complicated process. Um, ETS takes this stuff very seriously and they have a really interesting process. I was on the original CS principles, I forget what they called us, committee, consortium, something started with a C. Um, and we had to come up with a list of big ideas which were iterated over and then a set of what's called thinking practices. What are, thing, what are people do with these big ideas? And then we then crossed all of those to come up with all of the possible things that somebody might ask about on a test. Now those have since been iterated a lot since the committee. Um, working on this project, I had to go back and look at what's on csprinciples.org, and I don't remember writing some of that stuff. Um, so it's, it's already iterated, evolved in, in interesting directions. Um, they, there was a process of pilot testing at universities first, because all AP courses are meant to be representative of what's in the first semester at a university or college. So they were first pilot tested at university or colleges, and then at high schools, and now at both. And I couldn't tell you, it's in the, the, the dozens of schools that are places where they're currently pilot testing this stuff. 
So, and then, of course, the basis reason I was sort of wondering about all this is I was wondering how you do how the Ziva and what, what the, the, the teachers need to do. Well, Oh, so this is, this is mostly, all right, so all of that was about how CS principles came from. Most of the insights for this is coming from our work in Georgia Computes, uh, Barbara's work with teachers, um, Li Jing Ni's dissertation, uh, where she studied CS teacher identity, Tom Macklin, who's been our external evaluator for Georgia Computes all along. He and Li Jing did a really nice collaboration where they actually went out and interviewed teachers who had been in our professional development and looked at those who were doing more innovative pedagogy and those that weren't and really identified that confidence in the programming aspect was really critical for them to be willing to do things like inquiry learning in their classroom. So the, the I mean, in, in, in Yasmin's very kind uh, introduction, it is the case that I really draw on education theory and education data to drive what we do in terms of our computer science education efforts. Good. Have you thought about teachers using this yeah, we have, and uh, we've had lots of people comment on it. Brian Harvey's uh, at Berkeley, uh, the Beauty Joint Computing Project, his first, um, his first response when he saw this was, oh, if you just rip out all the teacher's notes, this is great for independent learners. Yeah, 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 maybe. But um, there's lots of people who are building things for the high school right now. I mean, the dozens of, of pilots. There's very few who are building things for the teachers. I want to stay really focused on our goal. I mean, in the end, CS Principles is going to make it or not, depending on whether or not we get enough teachers. And if our goal is to broaden participation in computing, I mean, I, sh I showed the data, having more teachers in Georgia had a dramatic impact on that. In the end, teachers are the key to making, in my opinion, to making CS education work in the United States. So that's why we're focusing on the teachers. So yes, that ain't my problem right now. So please. So I'm going to build up. Yep, so yep, stuff, absolutely. That how are we going to get to long-term memory to actually change that for teachers? So the question is, what, of, what designs have you built in or have you thought about doing sort of ongoing um, kind of self-organizing, community building, expertise stuff? So nothing on the self-organized part, okay. but we have been thinking about the bigger picture of the problem that you're describing. And that's actually part of these uh, the STEM C proposals that we're, several of us are working on right now. Um, the one the part that we want to do is that I think that the ebook. I mean, we've tested parts of this. We haven't built the whole thing and tested the whole thing yet. That's coming in the next few months. Um, I have I have bits and pieces of this currently working. I can demo if folks are interested. Um, but. Uh, we recognize that it's, it's, a, it's a learning intervention right now. It is not professional development. And as Tom Macklin um, likes to remind me, that uh, professional development without follow-up is considered malpractice. Um, it doesn't work, right? So what we really want to do is wrap around this a PD framework that connects to the CS10K community site. I would like those reading groups, when they finish a chapter, to go out and say, write some multiple choice questions to help with that. Or record an audio tour. You're going to have to teach this one day. Why don't you record yourself? And that becomes an audio tour for somebody else. All right? And then put it on the CS10K community site so that we can have peer feedback. Oh, I really loved your audio tour. The multiple choice question you had, I'd like it tweaked in these ways. Right? I want to have a feedback loop. That, to me, would be a PD framework to wrap around the ebook. We're not there yet. It's what we're proposing to do over the next three years. Uh, do you plan to have the, the teachers form their reading groups offline, or you have some uh, part of the portal embedded structure that allows them to socialize and to maybe make the pay programming part of it? That is one of a hot, that is a really hot research question for us that we're having a lot of discussion about. I really wanted to try to figure out some way of making this work as an all online PD. Um, my wise wife, Barbara Erickson, said to me, we have no idea how to make that work, Mark. Let's team up with, with projects that are doing face-to-face -face projects, 
right? So that people could develop rapport. And in that rapport, and I've already had various groups say, yeah, they'll do it. We'll pick out groups of reading groups. Yeah, these five, they, they get along, they'll work together. That'll become the reading group. So we'll figure out the groups face to face, load them into the system. Those will be the reading groups. Critical to me in all of this, um, and, and this gets to your, your point a little bit. I don't want going to the book to be real time. Like I talked to one project already, they said, oh, it'd be great. You could have the teachers finish the chapter of the book that's relevant before the students get to it. No, it's got to be at their pace. I want the group to say, hey, come on, we really want to get through this, this, this book. I want the reading group to have that pressure. But I don't want the added pressure of, we've got to finish this chapter before my students get to it. Because that means you're not really going to learn. You're not really going to spend your time on it to learn it. You're just going to crank through it really fast. And I want this to be something that, you know, half dozen chapters, but over the course of a whole academic year, finish it. All right, so that you really take your time, two pages today, maybe you don't get to it tomorrow, three pages the next day. It's not mass practice, it's spaced practice. We're more likely to get learning that way. We're more likely to develop a real depth of understanding that could lead to confidence and expertise. Wonderful. I want to thank Mark for giving a lecture.